Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sin like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Good morning and welcome uh, to our time of prayer and reflection this morning. We're streaming from the churches in and around Kirby Lonsdale and I'm Wendy and we welcome those of you who are watching from further afield or those of you who uh, live and are connected with our churches here. In our shared newsletter this week I mentioned the idea of a phrase called the dust of the rabbi and some of you will have seen that already if you've read the newsletter and it comes from um, many years ago I, I came across this curious uh, phrase when I was doing some study and I learned that in the Jewish tradition after having learned the Torah as children, a few exceptional young men from the age of 18 would identify a particular rabbi to apply to, to be a student. And then the rabbi would determine whether or not uh, that person was appropriate and suitable, whether he had the right credentials, and then he would decide whether or not to allow the student to be one of his followers. Now, these students were called Talmudim or Talmud, which is Hebrew um, a word for disciple, follower. And this tradition to follow the rabbi was much more than being an academic student. It meant to follow the rabbi wherever he went to observe and imitate every detail about that person and to include watching and studying how he related to people, what he said, how he communicated and all of those things, how he lived his life, including personal habits. Um, ben Sira was a rabbi of, um, of Jerusalem um, before Jesus' time, around 180 before Common Era. And he said, when his father or teacher dies, it is as though he is not dead, for he leaves one behind like himself. So in other words, no detail of a teacher's life is to be either ignored or left unreplicated. So these students followed so closely behind the rabbi that they got covered in the dust kicked up by his feet as they followed closely behind. Now Jesus had gained the reputation as a significant rabbi and he was respected as a person and as a teacher and a worker of miracles. And what's extraordinary is the way Jesus chooses his disciples. He chooses those who would not normally be seen as candidates for Talmud. In fact, he chooses men most people wouldn't give the time of day for. He turns centuries of tradition on its head and the disciples knew it. When he said, come follow me, Simon, Andrew, James and John would have been gobsmacked. So would all the others. It was utterly culturally radical and revolutionary. To be invited and accepted and initiated by the rabbi was, was by this rabbi was life changing. So I've got a couple of questions for us today as we ponder. How does it feel to be chosen by Jesus? And what does following Jesus mean for me this week? Will I be covered in the dust of the rabbi? So let's hear the story read to us now as we look forward to what Anne has to share with us later. Mark chapter 1 
verses 14 to 20. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. Amen. Hello, my name is Anne, and a few times recently I have been in the company of several other Anne's and have said, you can never have too many Anne's. Whatever our name, we are each of us unique, special, created to fulfil a unique role in our world. And our task in life is to find out what that unique role is and to faithfully fulfil it. So how do we do that? How do we discern what some call our vocation? This was a big question for me some 13 years ago when I sensed a possible call to ordained ministry. And within Christian communities, exploring your vocation has been, unhelpfully in my view, too bound up with exploring a calling to an authorised ministry of some sort. Discerning how you live your life, how you spend your time and your money, how to exercise your particular gifts and talents is about so much more than what you can give to the church establishment. But as God is at the heart of all things, beginnings and endings, and threaded through all that goes between, our discernment of who we are and how we should behave is totally bound up with God our creator, redeemer and sustainer. Totally bound up with God, our source of awe and wonder in life, or however else we experience the infinite and inexpressible possibilities in life. As a Christian, I believe that Jesus was God in human form, sent to show us how better to live our lives in this sphere of time and space and how to prepare to live our lives in eternity. So our knowledge of how Jesus connected with his first disciples, how they discerned his calling on their lives and how they responded, is interesting to consider. On a first reading of our Gospel passage today, it seems that Jesus appeared out of the blue, asked the fishermen to drop everything and follow him, and they, without hesitation, did exactly that. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I think, what about their business partners and their families, left in the lurch, abandoned without notice? But perhaps Jesus didn't appear out of nowhere for them. Perhaps they had heard about him. Perhaps they had been and seen and heard John the Baptist heralding his arrival. Perhaps they had been intrigued by the concept of the good news and the kingdom of God. But whatever had gone before, their response to Jesus' call to them was instant and total. But that wasn't the end of their story. And that's something I think we can take comfort in. That their initial response didn't mean they made no mistakes in the future that their problems were over and they would now live perfect, trouble-free lives. Far from it, as we learn from Peter's denial of Jesus in his hour of need. And as we learn from James and John arrogantly seeking special favours for their place in heaven. But from the point of their initial calling forward, 
they were living and learning alongside Jesus, playing their part, the part that they were created for in building God's kingdom. So what can we take from this for our own lives? We too have heard about Jesus and the good news and the kingdom of God. How have we responded? The fact that you are here listening now suggests that you have responded in some way, even if that is only to find out more. For many of us, the journey of following Jesus may have begun many years ago, either with a defined decision at a particular point in time, or with a gentle growing into Jesus' presence and service. But however it started, how does it feel to be chosen by Jesus? Because even if we think the choice was ours, Jesus, the other partner in the relationship, has chosen each one of us for the unique contribution that only we can make to the world, in our workplaces, our communities, our families and homes. And that decision is not a one-off, make or break, follow Jesus or deny him decision but it is an ongoing relationship. And as with any relationship, it needs ongoing attention, regular communication. Discerning how we act in life, the choices we make each and every day is an ongoing process. And in all of these choices, our relationship with God in Jesus should make a difference. What does following Jesus mean for me now? today, this week, this year? How does following Jesus affect and inform my choices? What I do, what I say, how I behave, and how my words and actions impact those around me? And for me, the way to discern these things is to pray, to communicate with God, to listen as well as to ask sometimes just to listen, to hear God's heartbeat, the rhythms of his grace, to be in tune with his concerns for our lives and the lives of all those we encounter. There will be things that we can do that no one else can, our unique gifts and talents that we can offer. So I pray that from this point forward, you may be able like the first disciples, to live and to learn alongside Jesus, to discern from him your unique gifts and talents and to develop them, to make mistakes but to learn from them so that you too can play your unique part, the part that you have been created for in building God's kingdom in the time and place where God has placed you today and in the weeks and years ahead. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again.
strength is failing, the end draws me, and my time has come. Still, my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever more. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy. It is now time for us to slow down, take stock of where we are, and to reflect on the future, and to gather up every bit of help we can. In the power of the Spirit, and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. We pray for everyone who tries to keep Jesus' commandment to love their neighbour as themselves. Please give us your wisdom, Father, to always know what is the right thing to do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for everyone who tries to love you with their whole heart. Please give them the strength of the Holy Spirit to always do the right thing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for everyone who tries to live as you did when on earth. Please give the love of Jesus the Son to always do the right thing with compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the nights draw in and the days become cold, we ask that people are not afraid of the dark, but reach out and find the light in your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As our leaders meet in Glasgow for COP26, we remember that climate change will not destroy the planet, but it will affect all living creatures on it. May our leaders show wisdom and courage in responding to its many dangers. And may we do whatever we can to make this a safe, and a happy world for our children and our children's children. May your wisdom help us all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for people, wherever they are, who are ill in mind or body and for those who have recently died and those who miss them. May your strength help us all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
and we pray with gratitude for the kind words spoken to us, our error overlooked, the smile of friendship, the hand of greeting. May your love fill us all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let us finish our prayers by joining together with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So thank you to everyone who's contributed to this time of reflection. Wendy began by posing two questions. How does it feel to be chosen by Jesus? And what might following mean for me this week? I think it's the first of those that I ponder quite a lot. Uh, and there's a lovely prayer from the Iona community, a gathering prayer. And it has this sense of us listening to the stories about God uh, and then praising God for the things that we hear goes like this. We've heard about you, God of all power. You made the world out of kindness, creating order out of confusion. You made each one of us in your own image. Your fingerprint is on every soul, so we praise you. We've heard about you, Jesus Christ, the carpenter who left his tools and trade, the poor man who made others rich, the healer who let himself be wounded. The Saviour who died and rose again, so we praise you. We've heard about you, Holy Spirit. You broke the bonds of race and nation to let God speak in every tongue. You drenched the disciples with grace. You showed how love made all things new and opened the doors to change and freedom, so we praise you. We've heard about you, God the three in one. And then... In the next line, it's like a lightning bolt that comes out of the blue. And you, Lord of all, have heard about us. You've put your ear to our heart, both when we prayed and when we doubted. You know well what we fear and question, what we long for, and from whom we turn away. And even when we become deaf to you, you never stop listening for us. And I often think we get our faith the wrong way round. Um, you know, we kind of think and behave as if it's all about us reaching out for God. When in fact, it's about God reaching out for us. God who listens out for us, who calls us, invites us to follow. How does it feel to be chosen by Jesus? We keep pondering that in these days ahead. The God who reaches out for us, listens out for us, calls us to follow. And so a final prayer, perhaps picking up on the things of this last week, and particularly COP26 and the challenges that we face. May God the Creator bless us in our care of the world around us, May Jesus, God's Son, bless us in providing for our children's children and all whom he loves. And may God the Holy Spirit bless us with the gift of wisdom until all creation is blessed through us for ever and ever. Amen. See you next week. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh.